Well, good morning, Grace Point. You can be seated. So glad that you are here this morning, that you uh, stepped out in the middle of the storm to come and be here. You know, in Scripture, uh, God does a lot of powerful things in the middle of storms. And so maybe this morning, God longs to do something powerful uh, in your life as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Father, we just ask that you would come and that you would reign over this time that you would speak, that you would move in our lives, that this morning we might be reminded of what you've done in our life, and that we might hear just a little bit about you that draws us closer into relationship with you. In the blessed name of Christ we pray, amen. Those uh, larger-than-life movie scenes that just sort of move us deeply uh, are something I think most of us love. One of my favorites is from the movie Gladiator. If you remember, uh, Gladiator, if you've seen the movie, uh, has been tricked and he's supposed to be dead. and He ends up a slave under the emperor who had killed his own father and was the reason that the Gladiator was supposed to be dead himself. And uh, there's this scene where he's kept his identity hidden, and uh, the emperor has come down onto the sand after a battle and is demanding that he reveal his identity. And he finally takes the mask off, and of course, the guy recognizes him. And then he has that just incredibly powerful moving line. He says, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix Legions loyal servant to the true emperor Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. You just sort of get those chills if you're watching the movie. We, we like that one in particular because it's this huge declaration of identity, this huge claim of who he truly is uh, in a number of different ways. And we uh, have the opportunity to see him declaring something important about himself. Uh, one of my favorite days of the year is not Christmas or Thanksgiving or birthdays or any of that. It is the first Wednesday of every February. It's National Signing Day for college football. <laughs> and if all goes well, it's better than Christmas. But I, I love it, and I, I, I tune in, and I'm following it, and I'm, I'm, I have issues. It's okay. You can pray for me, too. Um, but I'm following it to see what's going on. And, and one of the things that happens on National Signing Day, if you've never seen it, is uh, all these high school athletes choose and declare where they're going to be playing ball in college. And a lot of times now it's televised, and they'll sit there, and they'll have three or four hats in front of them with different schools. And you know, they act like they're going to put on one, and then they throw it, and they make a big production out of it. But eventually, they put on the shirt or they put on the hat of the school they're going to, and they make this declaration that's going to be a huge part of their life. This morning, we're going to talk about the declaration that you and I, who are followers of Christ, make when we enter the waters of baptism. That for us, it's just as powerful as that statement from the movie. It's just as powerful as National Sunday. In fact, it's more powerful. It's this definitive statement about our identity and about who we are in Christ. If you have your Bibles with you, you can flip over to Acts chapter 2. And to give you a little background here on Acts chapter 2, Jesus has come to earth. He's lived 33 years, a perfect life. He has been betrayed by one of the men closest to him. He has been taken. He has been beaten beyond recognition. He's died this horrible death of crucifixion. He's been put in a grave, and three days later, the grave is empty. He's been resurrected. He's appeared to over 500 people after his resurrection. And then you get to the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 80, he says, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all over the world. And he's told his disciples and his followers to go into Jerusalem and to wait for one that he's going to send, a comforter that he's going to send. And then later in chapter 1, Jesus is uh, taken, he ascends into heaven, 
And we hear that statement from the angels, why are you standing here staring into the skies? This same Jesus who was taken from you in like manner will return someday. And so they have now entered into Jerusalem and they've spent several days hanging out as a group in this upper room, waiting, praying for this comforter that Jesus promised was coming. And then we see that happen in Acts chapter 2. We see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it says they were all gathered together, and the Holy Spirit gets poured out. It says there's the sound as of a rushing mighty wind that fills the room where they were gathered. And they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And cloven tongues of fire appeared upon each of them. And so the Holy Spirit has come. It's indwelling them. They weren't expecting it. They didn't know what to to expect. But now they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And and they're speaking in languages that aren't native to them. But unbeknownst to them, as they're speaking in other tongues, there are other people from all over the world in Jerusalem for the Passover and the holidays who are hearing them declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus in their native tongues. And so they begin to gather outside this room and they begin to question what's going on. And at first, they, they, they accuse him of being drunk. And then it's Peter who stands up. Peter, who we talked about last week, who had denied Jesus and then had to be restored after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus now is going to stand up and deliver the first sermon of the church. And he says, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But they have been filled with the power of God. And he begins to testify to what is going on. And we sort of pick this up in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Peter is speaking. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Or your version may say, Brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his words were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So we see Peter in his declaration do something really interesting, because he's going to have them be baptized But he also lays out the fact that the old way of doing things has been done away with. He's speaking to Jews. They've been raised their whole life being taught that to have a relationship with God was based on their ability to do the right thing. It was based on their works. Over 600 laws that they were required to keep so that they might have a chance at being in relationship with God. And then we see here Peter in just a verse say all of that is done. You don't see him say, hey, if you'll keep the Ten Commandments and repent and be baptized. He doesn't say if you'll, if you'll keep the Ten Commandments and these ceremonial laws and repent and be baptized. Instead, he gives this message of grace that the only thing necessary to have a relationship with God is to realize your brokenness, to repent of your brokenness, to believe in who God is, and to signal that by being baptized in the name of Jesus. Baptism is this introduction from the very beginning that the old way of doing things is done away with, that there is nothing you can do to earn the favor of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. It's all been done for you And you simply have to realize that and put faith in that. And it's this outward sign then of this change that's going on. It's this outward sign of living into God's grace. Now, prior to that, the outward signs had existed by keeping the law, by being circumcised, things of that nature. But it's this outward declaration of identity. In fact, in one place, Jesus says this in Luke. He says, If you're ashamed of me before men, 
I'll be ashamed of you before my father. So this act of baptism, this declaration of identity in Christ, is showing the world that we're a new creation, that things have changed in our life. But it's not just outward. It's also a sign of this inward transformation, this life change that's happened. The word baptismo literally means to be fully immersed. And its historical context, part of what it would mean is that you were coming under the teaching. You were being fully immersed in the teaching of, the understanding of. So when we're baptized, part of that is saying, I am taking everything that I am, and I'm fully immersing it under the teaching of who Jesus is. I'm going to spend my life doing everything I can to be under what he has done. And then in doing that, it's the sign of new life internally that I share with him in the death, the burial, and the resurrection from the dead. Now, the other thing that baptism does for us is it's not just a, a statement of the, of the new covenant. It's also a statement to the world around us. If you flip over to chapter 10 there in Acts, verse 43 it says, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to stay and stick around for a few days. And in this situation, the baptism was not just a sign, it was a validation of their salvation experience. You see, this is where we see Gentiles, people who are non-Jews, having the Holy Spirit poured out on them. And it could have been that the church could have split right in that moment. We could have had the Messianic Jews, the Jews who'd, who had been raised Jewish, who had realized that Jesus was Christ, and we could have had the people who weren't Jews who were realizing who Christ was. But the act of baptism, Peter is saying, is they've experienced what we've experienced. So by being baptized, it was this validation that the salvation for them was the same as it was for the Jews, that they were a part of one family, that, that race meant nothing, that creed meant nothing, that that sexuality, you know, and male and female, it, it didn't matter because they were one in Christ. And so we get to celebrate that when we're baptized, that it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, it doesn't matter if you were born, you know, poor with a plastic spork in your mouth or rich with a silver spoon in your mouth. It doesn't matter if you come from a family that was always together and always loving or a family that was so divided that, that you had to go and live with your grandparents or you were a foster child. It doesn't matter what you've been through. The grace of God reaches to you where you are. And it's a statement to the world when we're baptized of that, that this is truly for all people. I, I love when it says there that the circumcised were amazed that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the Gentiles. And that the, the sign of baptism even went further to show us that the old covenant was destroyed. Because they were baptizing people who hadn't been circumcised into the kingdom of God, into the church, into this new ways. Another sign again, it's not the law. It's the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus. And then finally, quite frankly, getting baptized is an act of obedience. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 a very well-known passage, Jesus, some of his last words to his disciples while he was on earth. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. His command with them was to go and make disciples, but a part of that was to baptize them. I have lots of discussions with people about baptism because there's all different kinds of understandings and ways that we've been brought up and questions on baptism and people wanting to grasp the fullness of it. 
But what it boils down to at some point is just, are you going to obey what Christ has done? Are you going to obey his command to enter into the waters and be baptized because you've exchanged your life and Christ says that's the next step? You see, one of the parts of baptism for us is just another level of surrender to obedience. Like, like I get it, right? You're in water and you're immersed in water and somehow this is supposed to be this huge spiritual thing. But, but it is because it's obedience. And obedience requires surrender and submission to God and to those in spiritual authority. I, I didn't learn what it meant to live in submission and surrender until uh, I was probably 30 years old. I, I'd been a pastor for years. I'd been a Christian for years. But it wasn't until my life really fell apart again and I'd gone from having nice house and nice cars to losing everything that, that I learned what it meant to live submitted, to live in obedience, not just to God, but to godly men. And it was blind faith. I, I'll tell you, there are times they would say, this is what you need to do. And I'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want to do that. But my obedience, my obedience led to growth. The Old Testament says obedience is better than sacrifice that we obey what Christ has called us to. And a couple of lessons I had to learn in learning to submit and surrender both to God and to others. Uh, here are a couple of them. One is I had to learn to give up my right to be right. Does that resonate with anyone in the room? Any right fighters? Come on. Some of y'all have been married long enough. Don't look at your spouse, but you know. All right? You just right fight. Giving up your right to be Right? So when it comes to baptize, baptism, sometimes it's, it's, it's saying, I don't understand everything, but I know that God has called this, and I'm going to walk in obedience to be baptized. Uh, the other one I had to learn is that I could be right and not be righteous, and that God had never called me anywhere to be right. He'd called me to be righteous. And when you look at what it means to be righteous, part of it means to be obedient, to be surrendered, to be submitted. So we have some people here this morning that are uh, going to enter into the waters of baptism, and we're going to celebrate with them this morning. We're going to celebrate them immersing themselves in the teaching of Jesus and them publicly declaring their faith in Jesus. We're going to celebrate the symbolism of being buried together with Christ into death and raised to walk in newness of life. We're going to celebrate new life. But if you're here this morning and maybe you've given your life to Christ in the past, but you've, you've never taken that step to be baptized for whatever reason, couldn't get it worked into your schedule, had questions you couldn't answer, just haven't done it, good news. Today's your day. There's one verse in Scripture that says, here is water. What does keep you from being baptized? So this morning, if you've never been baptized and you didn't come expecting to be baptized, but you say, hey, I need to take that next step in obedience, if you'll just get up at any point and go out these doors right here to my right, to your left, uh, we have people out there who uh, want to talk with you. We've got plenty of clothes so, and towels, and we'd just love to have you and celebrate with you this morning and your baptism as well. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never even taken the first step, the first step of surrendering your life to Jesus. I'm going to ask you all just to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. Holy Spirit, come and do the work that you desire to do. Oh, that you would blow through our midst unexpectedly like you did in Acts chapter 2. You would consume us and overwhelm us. If you're here this morning... You don't understand all this about Christianity or about faith, about baptism. That's okay. But if you're here this morning and you know that your life is not going the way that your life should be going, the way you want your life to go, you know there's a lack of meaning and purpose, and you know you've made more mistakes than it seems like anybody else could make, you're exactly who Jesus came for. He 
came so that you could leave all that behind and that you could have new life. The ultimate do-over. And not just new life, but new life walking with him, with the, the God of the universe in relationship with him. And so if you're there this morning and you've never taken that step, you could just pray something like this where you are. God, I don't understand all this, but I know my life is not what it should be. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to live a perfect life and though horrible, to die a perfect death to cover all of my wrong and all of my brokenness and all of my mess. And then in his death, burial, and resurrection, there is freedom from all of my past and the opportunity for me to have new life. And I choose this morning to believe, to believe that Jesus came and did that for me. So I just ask that he would be Lord of my life and save me and make me whole. If you're here this morning and you prayed a prayer like that for the first time, you don't have to wait. You too can take that next step of obedience of being baptized this morning. If there are any of you this morning who would want to join us in the celebration we're about to experience, I encourage you just to stand and head out these doors. And as we're preparing for that, I wonder if we could all just stand and join this morning in singing this song.